Hi everyone, I'm Steve Dempsey with the Bay Area News Group and welcome to our discussion on President Donald Trump's first 100 days in office. Joining me is Pulitzer Prize winning syndicated columnist Leonard Pitts Jr. Leonard, thanks for joining us. It is my pleasure to be here. And, and you, you can see uh, Leonard's columns on a weekly basis here at the East Bay Times and the San Jose Mercury News. And people will really enjoy them, Leonard. You, you really do a great job. So Thank you. Appreciate it. And also, I just want to remind viewers that if you have any questions or comments, uh, there's a Scribble Live chat attached to this article. And you can ma make your thoughts known to us, and we may read them on the air. So anyway, Saturday marks Donald Trump's first 100 days in office. Yeah. And, it, <laughs> and it, it's been quite a ride, I'll tell you yeah. that. I don't think we've witnessed anything like this before from a U.S. president. Yeah. So Leonard, if you can, uh -huh. describe the first 100 days of Donald Trump's presidency. Well, you know, it's funny. Um, I was Somebody asked me to write a, a short piece on this um, a couple days ago, and the thing I was thinking about is how what I, the elasticity of time. In other words, if I'm a kid waiting on Christmas, 100 days takes forever. If I'm a condemned man on, in, 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 uh, waiting for execution, 100 days is like that. This is the longest 100 days <laughs> that I think I have ever known or, or, or thought could exist in my life. Uh, it is, um, it's, when I think about the fact that it's 100 days, it's depressing to think how many more there are, you know, to go, frankly. It's because this 100 days has felt like, uh, like a number of years. It's felt like very long years. And you, you wonder how much, if, if it takes this long to get to 100 days, I have no idea. I can't begin to guess what four years is going to feel like. Yeah, that's going to be really something. Is there, I mean, one thing or a collection of events that stand out for you since he took office? Well, that's the thing. It's just like when he was running for office, the moment that you're, that you're outraged by this thing, then that other thing happens. And while you're dealing with that other thing, this new thing happens. And then while you're dealing with this new thing, there's a development in that other thing that was temporarily on the back burner. It's like a nonstop perpetual emergency, a nonstop perpetual catastrophe, and also a nonstop run of things that never happened before things that are unprecedented, things that you don't just don't see, quote unquote, in an American president. So it's hard for really to fixate on one thing. As I said, I was writing a piece, a short piece on uh, on this 100 years, and it's like, okay, well, do we go with the Muslim ban? And what about the, uh, the healthcare debacle? If we do that, then what about the Russian scandal? Oh, what about the standoff with North Korea? I mean, there's just on and on. Now there's talk, he wants to do a, a trade war with, uh, with Canada. Canada, I can't remember the last US president <laughs> that was picking a fight. When did we ever pick a fight with Canada? What's Canada done to us? So, so I mean, it, is there any low point, any low point among low points, I mean, that we've seen? I know, you know, we could go go talk, we could start with maybe the treatment of the, of the media or, you know, as you mentioned, the, the travel ban or, you know, I mean, yeah. It's, it's really hard for the reasons I just enumerated to, to really come up with a low point. But I think one of the low points for me, frankly, was at the very beginning with the, um, the, the travel ban because I, I was embarrassed as an American, not only to see the chaos that is, that is caused around the world and all the people who suddenly get shut out of the country, but even more specifically and more painfully, uh, the guy who was a U.S. contractor who helped our troops, who helped keep our troops safe on the ground in Iraq, and this guy is caught up in the quote-unquote travel ban and can't get into the country. I mean, that was just that was just profoundly embarrassing to me as as an American. This guy risked life and limb and his family's life and limb and fortune uh, to help our troops in, in in tough situations over there. And then when it's time for him to you know come over and and be an American, the door closes in his face. That was just, that was profoundly embarrassing to me. Well, right now he's, he's, he's had, you know, just some huge failures, let's be honest. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, start like, like with Trump care. I mean, 
he he couldn't even get the Republicans to to go on his side for that. Uh, the interesting thing about about what's happening now in Congress is that I think the, if there's a silver lining to this, and I'm very wary of silver linings, but to the degree that there's a silver lining in this, I think it's the fact that the Republican Party has been has lost the excuse of oh it's the Democrats and they're the re you know they're the reasons that we can't do anything. The reasons that they can't do anything is because they themselves are in the, in the midst of a uh, of an identity crisis. They don't know who or what it is they want to be, who or what it is they stand for beyond no, beyond this whole idea of repealing the last 50 or 60 years. That seems to be their only, their, their working thesis, repeal the last 50 or 60 years, make America great again, as, 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 as Trump formulates it. And beyond that, there seems to be, there is no there there. And I do like the fact that, albeit at great cost to the country, that's now being shown. They can't agree with themselves on, on, on what it is they want. That's a, that's a powerful image to me. Yeah, because, I mean, they're, they're stuck. You know, the, as, as you mentioned, I mean, they, they have the majority. You're, the president is a Republican, and, yeah. you know, and they're stuck. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and nothing. You, you, you still got nothing. That, that's, that, speaks, that speaks volumes to me. It's not to say that Democrats haven't had disagreements, but... They've been able to, you know, they're able to work and compromise and do this and do that and, and, and come up with, with a working with a working plan when they had when they had that power. I think Republicans are so caught in this ideal of, of ideological purity. <laughs> there there can be no compromise. You, you have to be with with whatever it is I want. If I get if I get ninety five percent of what I want, I'm a failure. That seems to be the Republican ethos these days, and I think it, it's. It's it's uh, handicapping them from really being able to do anything to to the country's benefit. Frankly, I'm not I'm not I guess I'm not complaining, but I am saying that it does it does say something about who and what the party is right now. And not only that, but he he's issued 66 executive orders. I believe that's a new record yeah. at, at this point in a presidency. But he's had some some big defeats. I mean, uh, you know, the with travel ban. Um, and then, and then uh, yesterday, uh, where the feds they can't hold withhold federal funding to sanctuary cities. Yeah. So and, and don't forget the uh, the quote unquote so called judge who uh, embarrassed him on the Muslim ban. Yeah. That's correct. So he's so as far as uh, his immigration plan, and and we could throw throw the the wall in too. Um, it's not going so well. Yeah, and what's what's fascinating about all of this, I think by any objective measure, Trump's presidency in the first 100, year, 100 it feels like 100 years, the first 100 days is an abject debacle. I think I think it's it's a, it's a failure beyond beyond anything that we've seen before for any president in the first 100 days. And what's fascinating is how little that seems to cost him with his uh, with his base. And that speaks I think to the human tendency uh, not to, you know, they're, they're, they've done these studies that show that when, when you believe something and it's proven to be wrong, uh, you don't uh, you don't then change your belief. You, you you double down on the wrong belief. And I think I think we're seeing that played out with uh, with a lot of Trump voters and the fact that that they sit and say, oh no, he's doing he's doing very well. He's doing exactly what it is that 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 we, that we elected him to do. Really, seriously. I look at this stuff and I and I and I try to imagine any of any of this stench of failure attaching to Obama in the first 100 uh, days and, and what these same folks would say. I'm, it's a, it's a small thing, but it speaks volumes. I'm particularly um, I'm particularly drawn to. I don't know if you saw where he was on the uh, on a port on the uh, balcony of the White House uh, doing the uh, the the Star Spangled Banner, and his wife had to nudge him to put his hand over his heart. And I keep saying to myself, what if that had been Obama, <laughs> you know, who, who, who had all of the, you know, the questions and, 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 the, and the, 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 the suspicions and et cetera over his Americanness, and, you know, was, was demanded so many times that he prove his patriotism when there's actually no objective reason to, to, to question it. I just would love to have heard the, the response from Sean Hannity's, the, the O'Reilly's, peace be upon him, the uh, Limbaugh's, 
you know, if, uh, if, if, that had been, if that had been Obama. I mean, the, the duplicity and the two-facedness of, of, of those folks has never been more transparent. I guess, I guess in a way, I guess we, we could say that, I mean, do we have a president who's delusional? Yes, we had a candidate who was delusional. We have a president who's delusional. And to the degree that uh, the American electorate, you know, still think, uh, thinks he's doing a wonderful job, I think it's what, 42% or something like that? We have 42% of the electorate that's delusional. There is, and I don't care what your ideology is, what your political beliefs are, if you're a small government conservative, and you think this guy is doing well, you are delusional. If you are a big government liberal, you know, this guy is, 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 is not doing well. I don't care where you are on the ideological spectrum. If you think this guy is doing well, you're not paying attention or you are, you are fooling yourself. Well, I mean, from, from a, de a devil's advocate, let's just say. Sure. Okay. I, I know that his political career spanned 22 months. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's true. But, you know, he's been arrogant and mm. been rude and all that. But should we have expected something like this? Is Some of us did expect something like this. Um, you know, I did expect something like this. Uh, and like, you know, let's come back on you know him being a political novice. First of all, Eisenhower was a political novice, and I'm pretty sure his first 100 days did not look like Trump's first 100 days. Second of all. Um, we the people uh, elected him, knowing he was a political novice. So, you know, I don't, I don't know how much of an excuse that is. And third of all, I accept that nobody comes into the office knowing how to be president. With every new president of my adult lifetime, I've noticed there's about a three to six month shakedown period where you can tell they're figuring it out. I saw it with Clinton. I saw it with Obama, with uh, with uh, H.W. With, uh, with W. Bush, with H.W. and with, with, with Reagan. There was all, with all of them. There was a shakedown period where they made some 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 mistakes and the stupid stuff, stupid you know, um, bad optics stuff that they did uh, that they that you would not see them do a year, two years into it. So with every president, there's a shakedown period. But this is not a shake. This this is not shakedown jitters. This is the fundamental nature of the man that we see on display, and it's it's not reassuring whatsoever. In other words, it's not going to get better. <laughs> People, people keep people keep saying, well, you know, pretty soon he's going to make the turn. He's going to be more presidential. They said this after the joint session. You know, they said it all through the through the campaign. They said it after the joint session to Congress. And it's like, guys, he has no other gear. There is no other gear that he's about to go into that's just going to wow you because it's a combination of Eisenhower and, and Obama and Reagan. There is no other gear. What you see is what you get. This is who he is. Okay, but to, to extend this just a little bit, um, because he's been r rushing through things. Right. Executive orders, you know, we're going immigration, we're the wall, um, you, you know, all, all kinds of other things. And he's going really fast with this. Is he merely just trying to fulfill the campaign promises that he made? I think he's trying to fulfill the campaign promises. And at this point, I think he's desperate for a victory. Uh, of course, again, being Donald Trump, you know, he claims that all the defeats are, are victories. But I think somewhere, you know, in him, he's got to know that he's just been shellacked his first 100 days. Uh, and I think he's desperate for something that he can that he can cling to and say, "Aha, I did it." Uh, and you know, if he gets if he gets one victory, of course, he will he will, you know, magnify that into four. But that's just sort of the nature of, of the beast. I think that uh, what we're seeing now is sort of this. There seems to be no 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 overarching theme or plan. It's it's run to do this, run to do that, run to do the other thing, and I think that that's just uh, you know, the, the the need the need for some kind of victory, something he can hang his hat on. Um, kind of switching gears just slightly here. Um, the idea about Russia being being you know in these ties with Trump or his mm -hmm. administration or people associated with Trump. Um, does that, that's got to bother you a little bit, doesn't it? More than a little bit. Um, it's funny because I'm reading, uh, <laughs> I, for the first time actually, I'm reading um, Wood, Woodward and Bernstein's books on Watergate, All the President's Men and, um, and uh, The Final Days. And I'm struck by the, uh, by the drip, drip, drip nature of that, uh, of that scandal as, as it grew. 
because it, there, there is a certain similar drip, drip, drip quality to the Russia thing. It's like, we don't know what this is and fairness compels us to, to admit it could be nothing, but it doesn't feel like nothing. It doesn't smell like nothing. There seems to be some there there. And so, you know, you wanna you, you dig deeper and the more that you dig, the more disquieting uh, it, it, it becomes. And so, you know, the, as, again, as I said, Watergate is sort of the nearest comparison that, that, that I can find, uh, just in terms of the, the drip, drip, drip and the sense of disquiet. I have no idea if this would be as big or, or bigger and, or nothing at all compared to Watergate, but I do know that I'm starting to have, starting to feel that same sort of sense of, of disquiet that must have attended, you know, Woodward and Bernstein in the country as they sort of watched this, you know, third grade burglary mushroom into, into something much, much bigger. Yeah, the the potential ramifications uh, that would be some, something if uh, yeah. if there's something there. Exactly. If, if there's some there, there the ramifications are so huge that they they stagger the imagination. Which pretty much describes his first hundred days. So yeah. <laughs> uh, is there anything good you could see from from the, the first hundred days? Anything? Nothing out of Trump. I mean, I hate. It. You know, it's funny, I've, I've been writing columns about this, and, and usually when you write a column, no matter what the, the terrible thing is that you describe, you try to leave readers at the end with some smidgen of, of hope, you know, but we're America and we can fix this, or we can do this, or let's get together and make this better or whatever. And I have not had that. I have not been able to find that, honestly, with, with, with Trump. I'm, I suppose I could do it and, 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 and fake it, but that wouldn't feel organic, it wouldn't feel right. I do not see anything good uh, from this presidency with the exception of the fact that in three years and 11 months, the good Lord willing, it will be over. And that three years and 11 months are gonna be <laughs> exceedingly long, but that's the only good thing that I, that I can possibly see. Um, not even uh, his response to the gas attacks in Syria. I mean, he, he, you know, he, made, a, he made a statement right there and who knows? Maybe uh, uh, foreign leaders will take stand up and take notice. And no, he made a statement uh, that was, that, you know, that you could take as a statement of, of moral, you know, righteousness, et cetera, et cetera. Except for the fact this is the same guy who won't let those same people that he saw being gassed uh, come into the country, who's who's invade against them and called them them terrorists and, and so forth and so on. And, uh, you know, also the fact that the, uh, the, the, the bombing, apparently, from what I understand, they didn't really do any damage. The, uh, the airfield that was hit with the 59, I believe it was Tomahawk missiles, 59 Tomahawk missiles, was up and running shortly thereafter. So it made a statement. It looked good. And I'm not blaming him specifically for this because I've seen other presidents do this, make a statement that, that, that sort of looks good. But in terms of moving the ball down the field and so in terms of actually changing something on the ground with regard to, to, to the Syrian uh, civil war and America's response to it. I don't know that, that, that what he did accomplished a whole lot beyond saying, you know, wagging a finger and saying, we don't like this, don't do it again. Well, uh, I guess, uh, I guess the future doesn't look so bright here in the, in the early going, does it? Yeah, not, not too. Um, you know, to be, to be perfectly candid, again, as I said, my hope resides in the fact that we got three years and 11 months. Uh, and that uh, in that three years and 11 months, uh, frankly, if it continues the way that it, that it's doing, that it has been, uh, I can't imagine that even the most stubborn denialists won't come to realize what a historic uh, mistake was made uh, last November. I, that's, that's, the only, that's what passes for hope with me. It's like I hear people, you know, so many people say to me now, uh, I, I wake up and, and the first thing I do when I wake up is check my, uh, my bulletins on my iPad or my iPhone or whatever to make sure that we're not at war, the world hasn't been blown up or anything like that. And if it hasn't, then I go about my day. That's what, that's what substitutes, that's what constitutes good news now. You know, the, oh, the world, the world survived another night with, with, under, this, under this regime. And that's kind of how I feel. That, that's kind of how I feel. We've got three years and 11 months to go. I mean, you have to understand something. I, 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 I don't want to sound alarmist or overstating the point, but, but as far as I'm concerned, what we're looking at is possibly, a, what we're looking at is very much resembles an existential threat. 
to the country, to American democracy. And I've said this, you know, time and, and, and again, that, uh, you know, this is not business as usual. This is not, oh, I disagree with you, Mitt Romney, on taxes. This is, you know, this is not, this is beyond that. This, I don't, it's not even so much that I disagree with his policies. Half the time you, you wonder what his actual policies are. It's the fact that the man himself is personally so spectacularly unfit for the office that he holds. That's the problem, and then you get the policy. But first you got to deal with the man, and, and, and the man himself is, is problematic. I put it like this. I've, I've been telling people this, that if somehow this were all a dream and, 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 and it turned out that I had been catapulted forward, forward in, 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 in time and, and shown the results of a Trump presidency and then whatever force catapulted me back, to the beginning of the Republican primary and said, but you, but you can change this. I would quit my job and go to work for, for Jeb Bush. For <laughs> I, would, I would beg uh, Mitt Romney to run again. I mean, you know, that, that's where I am. And I, Lord knows I have no point of agreement with either of those men, but they are adult men. And I think they are mostly honorable and they're certainly intelligent men. And I would, you know, I would feel more comfortable with, with, with them, especially knowing and seeing what I've seen uh, since then. All right. Well, Larry, before we let you go, sure. uh, I'd like to talk about your new novel coming out just real quick called Grant Park, uh, covering 40 years about race in America. And it spans 1968 as well as 2008 when right. Barack Obama was elected president. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, Grant Park, which uh, was just released in paperback not too long ago, is a, is a novel about uh, about the changes uh, that, that that we've seen over the over the last uh, over the, that we saw during that forty year period. It's about, it follows two characters. One is a uh, is a star columnist for a for a for a newspaper. The other is his editor, black guy and a white guy, and it basically deals with their journey from uh, idealism in the nineteen sixties to the sort of jaded disillusion. With, uh, with, each, with, with, with black and white and with the whole idea that we can, you know, we shall overcome. Uh, that, that seems so, so, so near and so close in 1968. It's about them growing older and, and disillusioned and then about the, the, the set of circumstances, one of which is, uh, is Obama's uh, uh, election that sort of catapults them into, uh, into a new reality. It's also about a, a, an assassination attempt on the, on the incoming president. So there's a whole bunch going on. Well, that sounds great. I, yeah. I look forward. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and get, get a copy myself. I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. I hope you enjoy it. I, I think I will. All right. Leonard Pitts Jr., thank you very much for joining us. And My pleasure. And we're going to brace ourselves for the next three <laughs> years. Okay. I said three years and 11 months, didn't I? It's less, it's less than that. It's actually less than three years and 11 months. Yay. Yay. <laughs> we're, we're on our way. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Leonard, very much. All right. Take care.